Hi everyone. Today's topic is going to be desmoid tumor. Before we start the topic, I want to say a couple of things about these patients. These patients are very unlucky patients because these patients are affected with a disease which is very rare and many a times surgeons or other medical profession professionals are not aware of this particular disease because of which uh, this often often leads to mismanagement of the patients these patients suffer and uh, they move around from one hospital to another hospital and then finally a diagnosis is made and a diagnosis uh, and uh, and a treatment is given but by that time it is already too late so uh, we want to discuss about this rare disease and an important topic uh, desmoid tumor uh, our channel's name is think surgery we uh, i have also started a, a blog where i do post mcqs and after you have watched the video you can go to the blog and uh, uh, attempt these mcqs to further enhance your learning desmoid tumors are given various names uh those names are fibromatosis aggressive fibromatosis or uh, desmoid type fibromatosis they are monoclonal tumors they are uncommon tumors and uh they usually originate from the mesenchymal tissues an important aspect of uh the desmoid tumors are that that the desmoid tumors are locally very aggressive tumors they have got infiltrative properties but but they they lack the metastatic potential okay they are rare tumors and the with incidence of about 2 to 4 cases per million populations per year these tumors are not the tumors of the young people or the tumors of the elderly they mostly affect the middle aged adults and uh, there are two different types one are the sporadic types and uh, the uh, uh, and the one which affects the genetically uh, affected individuals which are uh, familial adenomatous polyposis syndrome patients and the gardner syndrome patients and turcot syndrome patients all right so desmoid tumors are as i've said they are locally infiltrative tumors they are locally aggressive tumors but they lack metastatic potential which means metastasis is not seen usually it's a rare tumor with an incidence of 2 to 4 per million they've got two different types um one is the sporadic type and the other one is the genetic types which are like basically when germline mutations are present sporadic types germline uh, sporadic types are usually it's, it's more common in females and the genetic types male is equal to female the incidence uh, uh, there's no specific gender predilection in case of a genetic type of uh, disease and uh, it usually affects uh, familial adenomatous polyposis uh, gardner syndromes and turcot Tur- Tur- syndrome if you look at the diagram over here uh these uh, we can see very clearly that uh, anterior to the uh, sacrum over here there is this soft tissue mass slightly heterogeneous and uh, this is a desmoid tumor so basically we need to understand that the desmoid tumor don't uh, always occur on the body surface but they can also uh, occur in the mesentery and in the pelvis moving on to the genetics of the desmoid tumor basically there are two distinct clinical pathological entities 
uh, based on the underlying molecular biology. So as I've said that there are two different varieties. One are the sporadic ones and the other where there is germline mutation. The sporadic ones uh, are associated with problem with one particular gene and that particular gene is CTNNB1 gene. What is it? CTNNB1 gene. Now what happens when this particular gene is affected when this particular gene is affected there is going to be an abnormal accumulation of beta catenin all right there's going to be an abnormal accumulation of beta catenin and because of this accumulation of beta catenin this beta catenin acts as a nucleus a nuclear transcription factor and therefore and the proto-oncogenes are activated and there is going to be rapid proliferation of the cells. So ultimately the culprit is beta-catenin which is going to cause the rapid proliferation of the cells and that is due to the genetic mutation in CTNNB1 gene and which is seen in uh, sporadic variety. If, if, if you can look at these uh, uh, these two histopathological slides, these are actually uh, immunostained with uh, CTNNB1 and it is a very specific investigation for desmoid tumor uh, so the ctnnb stains usually take up uh, these brownish stains and uh, therefore they confirm the presence of desmoid tumor now what happens in case of a germline mutation let's say familial adenomatous adenomatous polyposis in this particular case of fap uh, there's a germline mutation in the apc gene all right there's a germline mutation in the APC gene. Because of what happens, what happens in normally if APC gene is normal, then it gets to do something and that is destroy the WNTs or destroy beta catenins and therefore destroy WNT. But in case of FAP, what happens is there is a truncated APC gene. All right, there is a truncated, there's a truncated APC gene. And because of a truncated APC gene, the WNT and the beta catenins are no more uh, getting destroyed. And that is why this gets stored up and ultimately uh, leads to over proliferation of the cells. Okay, so this is a genetics, is a genetic basis of desmoid tumor. What about the clinical features and other important characteristics? See, typically a desmoid tumor, if you look at any body surface area, let's say a hand or a trunk, they will present as a mass. Okay, it's like a mass and uh, it is a firm, non-painful, non-tender mass, usually in the abdominal wall, shoulder, hip, limbs, mesentery or pelvis. I have already shown you the picture of a desmoid tumor in the pelvis, but these are non-tender, non-painful, uh, pretty regular masses. But we need to understand that in case of familial adenomatous polyposis patients, about 10 to 15 percent of those uh, FAP patients will be affected by a desmoid tumor and most of these desmoid tumors are located within the mesentery or abdominal wall so there is a very specific point that 10 to 15 percent of FAP patients will be affected by a desmoid tumor and most of these desmoid tumors will be affected will be present in the abdominal wall or mesentery well, apart from abdominal wall mesentery, they are also present in limbs, shoulder, head and neck. We can see in this particular diagram that there's a desmoid tumor of the head and neck region in a child. The problem with the desmoid tumor is that the desmoid tumors infiltrate the surrounding structures and they spread along the tissue planes and muscles. They have been associated with trauma, pregnancy, oral contraceptive use. It is seen that especially in FAP patients that they arise in the region of previous surgery. So a history of previous surgical exposure is important. All right. So the problem is that they infiltrate the surrounding structures and spread along the muscle planes, muscle planes and fascia. There are certain previous history which are important that is history of trauma history of pregnancy history of ocp use 
and history of previous surgery. The surgical history is actually very important because uh, it, it is an important risk factor for the occurrence of the desmoid tumor. Moving on to imaging, MRI is the preferred imaging modality for the diagnosis. Not only for diagnosis, MRI is also used for local staging and follow-up of the patients with desmoid tumor. All right, so MRI is the preferred modality for desmoid tumor. All right, if you look at T1 weighted MRI images, these tumors appear as homogeneous masses. These are these are iso iso tens compared to the muscle. But T2 weighted images, T2 weighted images are hyper intense lesions with greater heterogeneity. All right. So if you look at this particular diagram, on the diagram on the left, that is this is T1 weighted, and the diagram on the right is T2 weighted. These are T1 weighted MRI and T2 weighted MRI. So in the T1 weighted MRI, we can see that the uh, this particular lesion is actually the desmoid tumor, and the intensity of the tumor is same as compared to the muscle and these are very homogeneous all right these are very homogeneous but if you look at the t2 weighted image then these are bright or hyper intense and these are heterogeneous on t2 weighted imaging the diagnosis is usually done by a core needle biopsy which is important and not only core needle biopsy we need to also do certain staining and the staining is done with beta catenin all right beta catenin histologically if you look at desmoid tumors they are well differentiated bundle of spindle cells okay with abundant collagenous matrix so they are histologically they are well differentiated they are well differentiated they, compo they are composed of bundles of spindle cells and they have got abundant collagenous matrix they've got abundant collagenous matrix uh, if you look at beta catenin there is nuclear over uh, expression of beta catenin and therefore that forms an important diagnostic feature if you see the brown staining these are beta catenin staining all right so these are beta catenin staining and these are specific and sensitive for the diagnosis of desmoid tumor so after we have made the diagnosis how do we treat initially what used to happen is uh, the surgeons used to think that all right so there's a desmoid tumor the best thing to do is actually go ahead and resect the tumor with a margin with a positive margin maybe a one centimeter margin or a two centimeter margin but that is not the case anymore things have changed guidelines have come up because you see that once we resect out the desmoid tumor we are going to create a huge amount of deformity in the patient and the deformity uh, will add to the morbidity in the patient's life therefore uh, traditionally although resection of the tumor with a wide margin was the standard of care because the these tumors were locally aggressive and these tumors have an infiltrative nature they require large soft tissue resections with complex reconstructive techniques to achieve the tumor free surgical mar margins and despite of these uh, treatments the local recurrence is high all right so initially surgery was used for the treatment or resection we tried to opt obtain a r0 resection and there was a problem of defects which required extensive reconstructions But, uh, but, but the surgery itself caused a problem.
defects which required extensive reconstructions but you know, uh, but but the surgery itself caused a problem of local recurrence of desmoid because these are infiltrative in nature all right uh, a lot of uh, studies were performed and these studies actually showed that uh, the, uh, there's a better way of uh, dealing with these tumors and this better way of dealing with the tumor is actually watchful waiting how did they decide that waitful watching is uh, is a good strategy if you look at the tumors there's a time on x axis and the ratio of the initial size if you see the most of the tumors have uh, obtained a static straight line which means they are not growing anymore so after some time after some time most of these tumors actually stop growing and an important statement which was which is made in the Savistan textbook of surgery and many papers is that spontaneous regression occurs in as many as 30% of the cases therefore the watchful waiting strategy is the preferred strategy for managing the most patients with desmoid tumors that are not causing severe symptoms or close to critical structures all right so they, they said that most of these tumors don't grow for a long period of time so they stay as they are and 30 percent of them undergo spontaneous regression okay 30 percent of them undergo spontaneous regression which is pretty great therefore watchful waiting watchful waiting is the preferred strategy okay watchful waiting is the preferred strategy and how did how do we uh, go about the watchful waiting how do we do it the the strategy is to perform regular mris and to find out whether the tumor is actually progressing or they're static or they're regressing all right the what problem uh, with the desmoid tumor is that many of them can be near the critical structures and can cause severe symptoms in those cases surgery may be considered however watchful waiting is the preferred strategy what about radiation therapy radiation therapy was never used as the primary modality for the treatment of the desmoid tumor they were always used principally as adjuvant therapy after the surgical resection was done and they were used radiation therapy was used especially after obtaining a positive margin with surgical resection however uh, radiation is uh, also used for for patients who have developed recurrence and uh, but the problem with radiation therapy is that most of these uh, uh, patients have got severe side effects of radiation because these tumors are present in the mesentery and the pelvis and the and in the abdominal wall and uh, it causes radiation into secondary malignancies and the most notably sarcoma therefore radiation therapy was used as an adjuvant therapy not very popular the problem with radi radiation therapy is radiation induced secondary malignancy and most notab notably a sarcoma so that is the problem with radiation therapy what about systemic therapy in systemic therapy we have got various options like anti hormonal therapy and uh, uh, NSAIDs and low dose chemotherapy tyrosine kinase inhibitors and full dose chemotherapies if you use uh, if you think about anti hormonal agents these anti hormonal agents most popularly which was used is a is tamoxifen 
okay it is the most popular anti hormonal agent which is used for the treatment of the desmoid tumor they have been used either alone okay or in combination with nsaids as the first line medical therapy either alone or they combine with nsaids as the first line not the first line therapy as the first line medical therapy so if you want to think about a medical therapy to think about is going to be tamoxifen along with nsaids the advantages of using tamoxifen with nsaids was limited toxicity uh, adverse events were rare and the cost was low however uh, the response uh, after doing many studies it was seen that uh, the effect on tumor progression was not that great what about cytotoxic chemotherapy cytotoxic chemotherapy have also been used to treat patients with aggressively growing symptomatic or life threatening desmoid tumors who are not surgical candidates so these are the people who have got extensive disease burden and is life threatening disease burden and these patients who are not good surgical candidates cytotoxic chemotherapy can be considered all right emer patients who have undergone undergone anti hormonal therapy uh, like tamoxifen with nsaids and they have failed the treatment with anti hormonal therapy those patients can also be considered for cytotoxic chemotherapy there are many regimens which are available and we are not going to go into details of those regimens because it's not required or it's beyond the scope of the class however uh, recommended regimens have included low dose methotrexate with or without venblastin slash venorelbin all right low dose methotrexate with or without venblastin or venorelbin or there are certain anthracycline anthracycline based regimes which are also used the two drugs which are being used very frequently nowadays and have got shown excellent response those are imatinib and sorafenib sorafenib is being used and they have shown very good response and because how do we know because they have produced one year progression free survival rate of 66% with that we conclude this particular chapter of desmoid tumor uh, thank you so much for listening and i put in effort i hope you liked uh, the video and uh, go to the blogger uh, link which i will be sharing in the description of the video to try out some mcqs on desmoid tumor